Well, man, here we are back again. Normal episode. Well, we don't want to call it a normal episode, do we? We don't do normal episodes. Every episode is exceptional. And this one is going to be an even more exceptional gem among the diamonds. Abnormal is the opposite of normal. And is he going to call this an abnormal episode? I don't know. Maybe it will be. Maybe it will be. Every episode is abnormal. We're unpredictable. We're crazy. Well, how confident do you feel in what you got? I always feel confident. I'm fine. All right. All right. Well, you kick it off then. All right. My first idea is called National Anthem, and it is an opportunity to review and discuss the national anthem of all the different countries. So on the surface, that's the idea of my podcast to start with. I have got a deeper idea that makes it even better, but we'll start with that. National anthems. Well, my head is nodding. I think this is a good idea. There's fertile ground. Yeah. In fact, not only do I think it's got a load of interesting stuff to talk about and explore, but I think people are largely ignorant of it as well, and yet they'd be fascinated. We all have it in common. Mm-hmm. Where does it come from? Who wrote it? And all that kind of stuff. They do sometimes seem a bit samey, national anthems, so it would be a fight against the sameness of national anthems. But I'm not too worried about that. I think there'll be some funny ones out there, some with weird and strange lyrics and tells you a lot about a country as well, a national anthem. I think it's a good chance to explore the different countries and things like that. So it'd be a good, like, exploration of the world via the medium of their national anthems. Mm. So this is a sort of podcast where you can give your opinions, do we like it, do we not like it, but getting in an expert to say or some research and saying, well, actually, this is why it was chosen like the South African national anthem, for instance, you know, why did Mandela choose that one? You know, looking at all the tentacles of, of what led to those words and that tune. Choosing the tune is an interesting one. Why that melody? And mm. yeah, that's interesting. I like this. Have you got any favourite national anthems or do you not know many of them? Or I really only know ones that get played at Formula One Grand Prix a lot and at the Olympics a lot. <laughs> I have to say, in a strange way, I I love the British national anthem, God Save the Queen. And I think I love it because of its simplicity and its directness. It's not trying to be an overly complex fanfare. It is what it is, and it's a very straightforward... There's a tradition, obviously, there's a tradition to all of them. They're national anthems, but there's a timelessness about it and a simplicity. It's a bit like a hymn. So I do like it for that. But on the other hand, right down the other end of the spectrum is the United States National Anthem. Which is like a film score in itself. It has movements and it rises and falls and is anthemic and obviously the lyrics are well chosen and there's lots to unpack there. This would be a headlined episode of your podcast. But the melody as well just seems to rise and rise and rise and climax and then climax again. And I think we've mentioned that even before. The, obviously, there's F-16s that fly over the top at a crucial time that just seem to explode it. I like the French national anthem. I think mm. the French one's nice. My wife likes the German national anthem. I don't know why. She just does. What about the Australian National Anthem? I have to say I'm not a big fan of the Australian National Anthem. I find the lyrics empty. You know, when I hear them, they're familiar and they remind me of home. So they work, but they're so empty and flat. They're sort of descriptive of the geography, but they don't really say anything about the people. They don't say anything about the Indigenous people and about the long history of the country and all those sorts of things, and I think we could do better. Australians all let us rejoice for we are young and free with golden soil and wealth for toil. Our home is girt by sea. Lots, yeah. of, people, lots of people love it. We have the word girt in our national anthem. There's a, um, a two-volume sort of history of Australia that came out a few years ago, big, thick volume, and it's just called girt. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I didn't know that. Our land abounds in nature's gifts of beauty rich and rare. In history's page, let every stage advance Australia fair. My wife thinks the Australian national anthem sounds like the anthem for the holiday venue Kellermans in the film Dirty Dancing. (laughs) And every time the national anthem of Australia plays, she'll start singing Kellermans. And every time the Kellermans anthem plays, she'll get me to start singing the words to the national anthem of Australia to it. Yeah, that is fantastic. That is brilliant. Kellermans, we come together, singing all our 
Well, do you know the second verse? That's always the one Australians don't know quite so well. Well, being Australian, of course I don't know it. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's the tradition, that we have one but we don't know it. I have got it next to me but I'm not going to look. I think it's beneath our radiant Southern, Southern Cross. Cross. We'll toil with hearts and hands to make this Commonwealth of ours renowned among the lands. Yeah, that's right. Yep. I thought there's boundless plains to share. Or is that oh, the that's first after, one? That's after that. I'm now, I'm now cheating now. For those who've come across the seas, we've boundless plains to share. With courage, let us all combine to advance Australia fair. I have heard rumours of a of a third verse. Oh, hang on. Yeah, it, it, it's, I'm looking at this webpage now and it says full version and there's like this longer one with lots and lots of verses that I've never even seen. So. Oh, gosh. Anyway, there we go. The Kellerman's anthem slash Australian national anthem. It's like American Pie. It just keeps going. It's like, oh, yeah, there's another verse. Oh, yeah, there's another one after this. Yeah. <laughs> it just keeps going on. And <laughs> so a fun thing to do, I've called up this website that's got the lyrics to all the national anthems of the world and just choosing random ones and reading their their lyrics. Like you realise that every country thinks it's a pretty special country. Yeah. <laughs> so randomly I've called up the national anthem of Belarus. The free wind has sung free songs to thy name. Green woods caught them with friendly voices. The sun called us with its flame to a seed time far famed. The stars poured faith into broken forces. I imagine that's probably a translation from another language. which It doesn't is, rhyme. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> ma- maybe it doesn't do- quite do it justice when you start translating these things. But it is really good fun reading the lyrics of, and I think that would be a really good fun part of this podcast, would be like the, the grandioseness of all the lyrics of the national anthems. Mm, mm. I have got an idea to take this idea actually a step further, and that is we are in a World Cup year which, you know, when all the countries come together to play the World Cup. And national anthems are a very nationalistic country thing. Mm. So my idea with this national anthem podcast would be to turn it into like a World Cup of national anthems. And each episode you would pair up two national anthems and put them like head to head and decide a winner with the loser being out and the winner going forward into a future episode. So as the podcast progresses, you're like culling away the national anthems like a knockout sports competition going further and further and deeper and deeper until the final episode are the two podcasts that are like still standing and they have like a final playoff to decide what the best national anthem is in the whole world. So you're taking something that's really nationalistic and people take a lot of country pride in and turning it into this big worldwide knockout competition. That would be fantastic. I love that idea. Mm. I love it if people could get into the spirit of it, not just voting for their national anthem, but thinking objectively and trying to, you know what I mean, discern. Oh, uh, yeah. I didn't even think about giving people votes. That's probably not a good idea. Maybe it is. That would be fun. I was thinking just like the our judging panel or our hosts would decide, but maybe you're right. Maybe it could be like a public vote. Oh, right, yeah. But yeah. I imagine it would become a bit like uh, the Eurovision Song Contest if you make it a public vote and people will start like, you know, rallying behind certain countries and not making decisions based purely on merit. Right, yeah. Cool. That is a good idea. I love that idea. I love the second idea. There is a um, another sort of tangent this could go on as well because it, I think most countries have their official national anthem, but they also have sort of their national song, like a song that is the thing they sing in the midst of tragedies or when they're overseas and having a great night with other people from the same country. Like, for instance, Australia has Waltzing Matilda. Yes. I mean, it has these other pop songs too, but Waltzing Matilda is a traditional song written by Banjo Patterson, is it? It was in the running to become our national anthem and didn't win the vote, and a lot of people still think it should be. That's right. It's sort of, I've heard like a, a country singer in Australia, I think Slim Dusty, before he performed it saying, all right, let's sing our national anthem. And then, you know, a true national anthem and launches into Waltzing Matilda, which is an interesting piece to choose because it's about a guy that steals a sheep and then runs away. <laughs> it's just that notion of the Australian underdog. And, yeah, and then commits suicide by, yeah, by, yeah. by drowning himself. Yeah. That's right. That's yeah. right. And his ghost may be heard. As you pass by that billabong, you'll come a waltzing Matilda with me. It's peculiar. But I mean, I imagine other nations have these as well. Yeah, I mean, England in some ways has Jerusalem. Is oh, it, yeah. It's a song that, you know, gets sung a lot at, at big events. Maybe it's about the lyrics and then somehow it's, it's old enough and, and it gets transferred into something else. Mm. I'd be interested. People can put it in the Reddit what the song is of their particular nation that they yeah. think. Is, like um, New Zealand has uh, Slice of Heaven by Dave Dobbin. 
that's exactly that is like a New Zealand national anthem. If, you, if like if you're with New Zealanders and that song comes on, they go crazy. That is a great song. I, I, don't love ac- I don't actually know what the actual New Zealand national anthem is. I'm going to look that up. Isn't it God Defend New Zealand? I think that's Ooh, it. Here we go. Let's see if you're right. Certainly New Zealand needs all the help it can get. It oh, looks like you're right here. Yep. God Defend New Zealand. And that was written by Neil Finn. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Jonah Lumu. It's uh, God of nations at thy feet. In the bonds of love we meet. Hear our voices we entreat. God defend our free land. Guard Pacific's triple star from the shafts of strife and war. Make her praises heard afar. God defend New Zealand. And on and on it goes for quite some time by the looks of it. It also has a Maori version where the words are are in Maori. Oh, yeah. I don't know if it's still the exact same lyrics. I don't know what Maori, like the God of Maori people is, but anyway. I think their national anthem should be the haka. It's pretty cool, yeah. That's a <laughs> that, that is I, a war dance, basically. Well, I think all countries are jealous of the haka. It's like I wish we had something like that. It's so awesome and feels a wonderful sense of connection and belonging, and it's intimidating, imposing. That's what it's supposed to be. Yeah. There is another Australian song called the um, "I Am You Are." We are Australian. That's oh, there's nah. been a bit of a push in the '90s for that to become our national anthem, but it's partly because it talks about the migration, but it also talks about the indigenous people. But it's a mm. bit. Thin, it's really. a bit of a poppy song. That was made for a TV ad, wasn't it? So, yeah, like, yeah. I think the big candidate against Advanced Australia Fair during the vote, along with Walsing Matilda, there's a, is there a song called The Song of Australia? Yeah, The Australia Song. I remember looking at this. This is going back to Australian studies back at school. I remember it talking about flowers and wattles and it was quite, quite flowery. The Song of Australia was written by English-born poet Carolyn Carlton in 1859 for a competition sponsored by the Gola Institute. The music of the song was composed by the German-born Carl Linger. How does it go, man? Give us a rendition. I'm looking for the lyrics now. Here are the lyrics. There is a land where summer skies are gleaming with a thousand eyes, blending in witching harmonies and grassy knoll and forest height are flushing in the rosy light. And all above is azure bright Australia. There is a land where honey flows, where laughing corn luxuriant grows, land of the myrtle and the rose on hill and plain. The clustering vine is gushing out with purple wine and cups are quaffed in thee and thine, Australia. And on it goes. Wow. Hmm. I like like, like that you get to the second verse and we're already boozing on wine. (laughs) Anyway, there we go. National anthems and then maybe my idea, taking it further, a World Cup of national anthems. I think that has merit. I think that could be a lot of fun. It'd be quite long if you did the World Cup. It would be like it would take you lots and lots of competitions to whittle it down. And also, you know, national anthems are quite popular on the internet, so I'm sure lots of such analysis kind of programs and things exist. But I'd be up for it. I'd be up for it. I love national anthems. But let's move on to an idea from Tim. Hey, everyone. I want to tell you about a fantastic offer at Audible at the moment. Right now, for a limited time, you can get three months of Audible for just $6.95 a month. You can give yourself the gift of listening, and while you're at it, you can think about giving the gift to someone else as well. I want to encourage you, if you want to take advantage of this, go to audible.com slash unmade. Or if you're in the US, our listeners over there, you can text UNMADE to 500-500. But everyone else, go to audible.com slash UNMADE. It's a fantastic way to engage with audiobooks, which I love. I'm so excited about the one that I'm listening to at the moment and has just come out and is a really unique feature. And that is the Beastie Boys book. Now, I've been a fan of the Beastie Boys since I was a teenager. I remember seeing them back in the 90s, about 95, 96 they toured, and I've been listening since Licensed to Ill. I love the Beastie Boys. Sadly, they're not operating as a group anymore because of the sad demise of Adam MCA Yauk, who died in 2012. But Mike D and Adam Horowitz have put together this really massive jam-packed biography of the band. It not only tells the story of their life growing up in New York City and the band coming together, it's a bit of a window into the music industry and a whole bunch of stories through that time in the 80s and then the 90s and then in the new millennium. But they've done something that 
I'm not aware of anyone doing before. It may be something that's done from time to time, but just like you might have guest artists on your album, they've actually got guest narrators. So they're narrating parts of the book themselves, but then they have a whole amazing list of people who are guest narrating with them as well. And I'm talking about Ben Stiller and John Stewart. They got Snoop Dogg, John C. Riley. They got Bette Midler, believe it or not. Spike Johns, the really cool filmmaker. They got Kim Gordon, who was in Sonic Youth. Will Ferrell is in there. Chuck D. from Public Enemy and Elvis Costello and Jarvis Cocker and other musicians. Steve Buscemi, legendary actor. So they got these all these people. And I think that's a fantastic idea because it is a huge jam-packed story that unfolds. And again, it's just come out, I think, last week, so I've just been listening to it. It's just a fantastic idea, I think, to have all these people narrating a story of a band and the whole culture and everything that comes with it. I think it's a real event release to listen to and something innovative and different. So if you want to get onto that, if you want to listen to the Beastie Boys book, then you just need to take up this amazing offer right now with Audible, which is just for this limited time, three months for $6.95 a month to listen. And to do that, you go to audible.com slash unmade, or you can text if you're in the US, unmade to 500 500. All right. My idea is, well, it's called Snippet. And it's an idea that builds on an idea from a film. And I need to explain the premise first. And the film is called Smoke. And in the film Smoke, which is a 90s film written by Paul Oster. This film, by the way, obviously has had a huge impact on you because yeah. you bring it up all the time. Oh, I do love it. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. the guy who wrote it, Paul Oster, is my favourite author. And right. The film is it stars Harvey Keitel and I really love it. Mm. But there's a scene in the film where Harvey Keitel, who owns this little cigarette store in Brooklyn, every morning at 7am, I think it is, he goes out with his camera at the same place on the same corner and at the exact same time takes a photo. And he's been doing this for years and years and years and years. So he has all these albums full of photos of exactly the same spot. And there's a beautiful scene in the movie where a guy who's a regular customer who lost his wife several years ago is um, just, they get chatting and he comes around to have a drink at his home and he's looking through them all and he says, but they're all the same. And Doggy says to him, No, it's in the details. I think he says God is in the details. Look closely. And he realizes, oh, they're all different. Then suddenly he sees just a glimpse of his wife from several years ago walking past at that time. And that's a really beautiful moment. But I I love the idea of having a photo on the same place at the same time every day, just seeing what's there. Hmm. A podcast obviously doesn't lend itself to that kind of visual idea. So I'm calling this podcast Snippet. I'm trying to think of a way in which you could grab a snippet of sound from the same place every day and see what conversations you catch midstream. Now, this may break some laws. So, for instance, because you need to be in a public place, and I'm thinking, could you grab a snippet of sound from, you know, 7 a.m. to 7.01 on a train in a particular carriage or something, and you just grab a snippet of conversation, even if it was only 10 seconds or 20 seconds, and you grab it every day and you play it, And then you talk about what conversation you've caught midstream. And so it's a snippet of conversation and you try to say, wow, I wonder if that, is that a person on their mobile phone and who could they be talking to and what are they saying? And you can just basically have a discussion about the snippet of conversation. There might be a better way of capturing it somehow, but an oral version of that idea of the smoke every day. I like the underlying premise here. I haven't totally figured out how to make it work. Are some way of grabbing a snippet of conversation that's regular and then extrapolating out where it could go or what it could mean. And I imagine like in the smoke oggy example, there's a strong chance you're going to get things repeating themselves. Like the same businessman on his way to work with his briefcase will turn up lots of different times in the pictures. I don't know if that's what you're trying to achieve with the podcast or not. If you are trying to achieve it, then it's important to be in the same geographic location and also to be reasonably consistent with your time. But if you're not too wedded to that, I have like a different idea that is born out of what you just said. And your snippet could not be pinned to a place or a time, but pinned to something else arbitrary. For example, you could call a podcast 38 And every snippet you get is just in seat 38 and it could be seat 38 on all different trains and and then start going to theatres and start going to all and planes and things and just going to seat 38 each time. 
and seeing who's there and what's there. And that would be quite a fun podcast with like a random but linked way of choosing the people. But it doesn't quite achieve what your idea and the Oggy idea achieves because suddenly you're everywhere and you're not getting that consistency of place and the Mm. consistency of time. So it does leave behind something nice about your idea, but it does give you something new that breaks you free from the constraint of this having to be a sound podcast. Oh, yeah. Well, the thing that I do like about the idea is being in the same place regularly. Right. Because I think it's unusual. While a photo, yeah, sure, a person might be running to catch the same bus at the same time every day, they're unlikely to be having the same conversation in the same place every day. So if there is a way of at a bus stop or in a place where people are having conversation, waiting in line at the same time every day, and you could, let's say, legitimately record Hmm. the conversation between two people or a person on their phone, and it's just a snippet, and then you try and extrapolate out from that you know, possible ideas. And you could make fun of it as well. And But there's that regularity that I like. That's the idea. The problem is no one has conversations anymore. They're all just sitting with their head buried in their phones. Yeah, that's <laughs> the right. Yeah. Old, the old days of people talking at the bus stop long gone. But Yeah, yeah. So there's got to be a place where people, where do people have conversations? You overhear conversations still. I mean, a good place is a place where people are forced to have conversations like counters and things like that where you interact with another person like at a shop counter you know at the local post office or something like that if you could somehow make that work on a permission level you know you're always just recording certain conversation i guess at a post office counter some of the conversations can be quite similar too but yeah you need to be a place where human interaction is forced upon us we recently found some old cassettes laying around at mum's place and we put them in and listened to them and there's recordings of like my dad and myself as a kid and all these things from years and years ago Hey, Mum, how come there's a dead fly in the tape recorder? Oh, I don't know. (laughs) There's a dead fly caught next to the tape. And these these snippets of conversations and longer conversations. That was beautiful. Yeah, that was beautiful. And Bev's dress was just layers of cream lace. It was was just a normal wedding dress. Lovely. Normal wedding dress. No, it wasn't. It was different. Well, it was kind of different. She had flowers in her hair. But there's once upon a time when it seems like my parents and, and other relatives well before the internet, would record a tape, like a tape letter, like a long talk on a tape, and and then they would just post the cassette and oh, then they'd right. list it in. It, it sounds charming to do that, but one of the great things about it is that we've still got a few of these laying around with, like, tape letters, and so you put it in and you can hear people's voices who, are, who have long passed away. I had a wedding tape I have not done because I've been so busy with the bedroom this week, but I shall do it straight after now, then I will send them uh, straight to Graham Most. It might be straight a copy to How you. How did that make you feel? Was it was it an entirely good feeling? Like hearing, like for those who don't know, Tim's dad has passed away. Like, what was it like hearing his voice? You say, is that just like a wonderful positive experience for you? Is it, yeah. is it in any way negative? Or? No, no, no. It's it's magnificent, absolutely brilliant. I tell you one thing that's interesting about it is that my dad is Dutch, so he had a very strong Dutch accent. Everyone always said, but I could never hear it because he was my dad. I grew up with it all my life. And so he, he, I just could hear my dad saying things. I never heard him. I <laughs> your, never heard the accent. <laughs> your dad had a very strong accent. We will see what is happening. For now, I do not know what to say and that tape is nearly full. I never thought so. I could hear him mispronounce words, but he was mispronouncing them, you know, without the accent. It's just that that's the way dad said things. And they were so familiar that I knew he always called things a certain you know, mm. different word. Having not heard his voice for years and years, when I put the tape on and listened, I could really hear his accent. It really struck me how strong his Dutch accent was. And isn't that so interesting? My ears, my brain has unlearnt dad's voice. And then I heard it again. It was so familiar, but it was like, wow, that's a strong accent. Well, you can sing on it yourself if you want to sing at home and put a couple of <laughs> solos on. And, uh, you can so make we, it, this okay? thing is... It's very handy. Was he being recorded in a deliberate way? Was he talking to the microphone or was it an incidental recording? Or? No, no, he was. this was one of those um, recordings to send as a letter to someone. I think oh. it was being sent to my grandma. And it's so funny. They're just chit-chatting about all sorts of stuff. Like, is it formal like a letter? Does it sound as if like maybe it's being read or is it just some guy meanderingly thinking, uh, oh, oh, by the way, by the way, another interesting thing is that uh, Tim learned to walk today or something or is yeah. it more like, dear Gladys, I hope everything is well over no. there in Amsterdam. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's very casual. So it's, okay here we are and uh you know there's no thought got into what we're going to say and you know and they start talking immediately to details like made scones today and uh 
Today I'm doing some ironing. It's just a little raining outside, so I thought, well, I'll do some ironing. Tim's playing outside with his friend Shane from over the back fence. Removing the sentimental value of being able to hear your dad's voice again and like that it has that preciousness now, can you imagine what it must have been like like just receiving this if they were two friends? Do they seem really like boring and inane or do you think it's something you would have liked receiving at the time or does it seem really kind of awkward and weird now? I think it's more personal than a letter and so it's really wonderful for them to share and hear. It's like a telephone conversation. I guess it's almost exactly like a telephone conversation because on a telephone conversation you give the big headline news. You say, what else is going on? You go, well, you know, and then you go, what are you doing next week? So big day, you know, you get down to details and it's just like that. It's very different when it's one way though and you're kind of just like guessing at what to say. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it sound planned or does it sound really unplanned? Sounds really unplanned. Mm. <laughs> it sounds like let's do this, press record. Okay, what should we say now? So what I think I thought I'd do is finish this other side. I hope you received the wedding tape by now. And I just thought I'd let you know what's happened since. But, of course, there's lots of things that is going on. And then it says, okay, well, you know, so-and-so's here now. They're going to say hello. Hello, you know. Oh, okay, <laughs> then, right. <laughs> uh, yes, well, you know, and they kind of repeat some of the things that's been said by, <laughs> by the other person. You know, so it's, I've already told them that. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are you on any of them? Like are there any where your dad says, oh, look, let's get Tim in the room and then you start talking? There is. There is. The one we found, yeah. So it's my voice as a little kid, which is really amazing. That is really cool. <laughs> it's both charming and cringeworthy and glorious. You know, it's like, wow. I just done up my skateboard. I, reckon, I, I made it up really cool. I made it into a vision skateboard. Do you know what? If you found a big cache of these, because people must have keep caches of them from when this was a thing, that in itself would make a great podcast. Oh, wow. Just, You're re- right. just re-uploading a bunch of these old letters, like from, <laughs> you know, Jerry and Maud in the 1978 the Jerry and Maud letters from 1978 between, you know, Holland and Australia and just, like, listening to them. And if the characters were right, they'd become, like, these cult heroes, like, with these yeah. inane <laughs> conversations about cakes they've baked. and <laughs> You could follow along and there could be Reddits for them. And <laughs> and there'd be, like, yeah, and there'd be, like, characters that you're always whinging about, like, oh, I'll bill at the church. He's such a pain in the butt and he always parks in my car park. And <laughs> and, like, there'd be these, like, these villains for these inane reasons. and You'd be cheering along weeks later, give us more on Bill. What's yeah. happening with Bill? Yeah. <laughs> Bill's my favourite um, co-star. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah, there'd be these, these, but there's these third-party people you know nothing. Oh, I love the idea of that. It is a bit of a moment in time, isn't it? Because obviously no one does that anymore now. It's just so ridiculous with iPhones and, and technology and FaceTime. And obviously there was a, an era before then where the technology wasn't available. The idea of putting a cassette mm. in the mail would have felt indulgence. So there's this sort of, I don't know, 1960s, 70s, probably 1970s, 80s time when that was sort of something that was done. But there's a few of them laying around and they do get a bit dull after a while, after the charm webs off, but mm. perhaps for fresh ears that enjoy it, especially if you edit it down a little bit and got some interesting parts. That's a good idea. What would you call it? What would that podcast be called? It'd be called something like the Jerry Tapes or something, wouldn't it? It'd be oh, called okay. the, the Something Tapes, whoever your characters are. Right? Yeah, yeah. Surely. <laughs> but when, when you think about it, it is quite a skill too. Like imagine if I said to you now, Tim, all right, I want you to record 10 podcast episodes. I'm not here for you to talk to. You're not allowed to write a script or anything and you're not going to be reading it. You just have to waffle for 60 minutes. Yeah. I'd kind of struggle. I'd feel a little bit like, oh, what do I do? What do I say? What's interesting? Like it's really hard to just sit here and talk to a microphone about just your life and keep it interesting and engaging. So there's a real skill to it. If I knew I was recording it for you, in other words, okay, I haven't seen Brady for two years. We've sent a few letters, but now I'm going to tell him what's going on. You could kind of systematically work through your life and give a really comprehensive amount of detail. But you're right, after about 10 minutes, you'd be going, you really don't need to hear this. Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> what, what am I saying, telling you this for? But also just telling you what I did this week in kind of a coherent, structured, well done way without questions and feedback and any anything to bounce back on, even with that body language to bounce back on, just someone nodding and going, hmm, yeah, like to kind yeah. of shepherd you through your stories, I can imagine is not that easy. It's certainly something I would find difficult. 
Maybe, I mean, obviously maybe people like your dad found it difficult too and that's why they're quite boring things to listen to. But Yeah, so it may have been difficult, but I guess depending how much you love and miss the person, it's still wonderful to have it at the other end, you know. Yeah. I wonder if it could be like radio. It's not so much about the information, but you just love playing it. Like maybe you just play it going to sleep at night because you love that person. It's comforting to hear their voice and they're so far away. Mm. You know, so it's sort of ambient noise in a way. You just like having them chatting. Like some people just love having the TV on in the room even if they're not watching because they feel lonely without it yeah. this could be something in it and yet it's someone that you love and miss and you just play over and over if your dad was recording this to send to someone else why have you got the tape did he never send this one or no there's a sort of there's a bit of back and forth that's not a bad question so what you do you the, the message will come back on the other side of the same tape or something yeah maybe that's it maybe that's it there's back and forth. A lot of it was done with my grandma. We were living, this is when we were living in Victoria, in near Melbourne, and grandma was in Adelaide. So there was sort of doing back and forth. So all of us are on there talking to grandma. So I don't know. Perhaps there is, I haven't listened to them comprehensively enough. I haven't done a full transcript yet to no. work out why that is. But perhaps it is record one side, turn it over, record the other side, send it. Maybe back. this one was never sent. It was the unsent tape. Ooh, the unmade yeah. The unmade, yeah, the unmade it tape letter, yeah. <laughs> Genius dad was leaving as an idea. He, ready to explode. he pioneered this podcast. I love it. It is. It would be a fun thing to do. Um, I mean, it'd be a good a bit podcast. Of a it'd be a good podcast. One way conversations that I'm sending to Tim and you're sending back. You know, a bit like there's a YouTube channel, the Vlog Brothers, kind of do that. These two brothers send four minute videos to each other, where they're just one way conversations each week. But they're quite pithy and well edited and quite a bit more polished. But there, it is like you know, letting the audience be the voyeurs on a as a conversation as it goes back and forward. So there we go. This snippet is the original idea. It maybe has some flaws. But maybe a snippet or a section from an old one and then a conversation about what was going on there. I like snippet, but what I really like the idea of is uncovering this treasure trove of someone's audio tapes over the years. We can, you know, the podcast, I haven't listened to it yet, but the podcast, my dad wrote a porno where this guy uncovered this romantic erotic novel that his dad wrote years ago and never did anything with or published and the young friends now are reading through it and having a laugh at what dad wrote all those years ago that's a sort of a similar thing isn't it finding some hidden thing that was never meant to be public and analyzing it and going through it I think is a really I don't know it appeals to me and probably the most interesting part in these recordings would be the incidental things that they say like oh hang on uh, instead of I'll just turn off the gramophone or <laughs> I mean this is <laughs> This is 1978 or something, so there's no gramophone. Yeah. But it's their incidental mentioning of things that yeah. have different Or like um, some names. pet dog that always walks in the room when it shouldn't and like, oh, go away, Fido, you're in the way again. And like, and Fido becomes this like legendary character, <laughs> this long dead dog that's, like, <laughs> that's always interrupting. And- Come and say goodnight to Arnie Faye. Did you tell Arnie Faye about that? Come on. Say goodnight to Arnie Faye. There we go. So there's a couple of ideas there. Interesting. God bless. Bye-bye. Tell me what you think of this. All right. Exception to the rule. This is a podcast where you talk about something where your opinions or your feelings or your views are pretty solid, but there is an exception. So to come up with a hypothetical example, um, I love U2 and I love all the U2 songs, but there's one song of theirs I don't like. Uh, I don't like numb or something like that. Like, there's an exception to the rule, the general rule of my life. Numb's a great song. That was just a made up one. Oh, okay. All right. Or, like, um, probably one that's more applicable to my life is I love watching almost any sport. If I put the TV on and Lawn Bowls is on or some sport I'm not particularly into, I quite like it. But the exception to the rule is ice hockey. I just can't get into ice hockey. And if I put it on, I'm like, I don't like watching it. It's just a sport that doesn't do it for me. So that's kind of like my exception to the rule for some reason I can't explain. So this podcast would explore people's exception to their rules, the one thing that is a bit of an aberration in their otherwise consistent view in life. I like this idea and I think it has a lot of potential because you can apply it to anything. So many, I mean, you've mentioned sport, you've mentioned music and they're kind of our two favourite things in a way, but it can go out from there into all sorts of fields. You can talk about places. I love visiting that part of the country, well, except for driving through that area or, you know what I mean? I love yeah. this branch of wines, except this one here is just, I don't know what they did there and away it goes. I really don't like 
radio presenters for some reason. Like I'm notorious in my household for moaning about how I don't like this radio presenter or that radio presenter. So whenever my wife puts on the radio, I'm like, oh, I don't like this guy or I don't like this person because I just they annoy me after a while. I don't mm. know, I'm probably just like a grumpy old man. But then there'll be one or two radio presenters who I like and I always make a big deal about it. Like so if we're in the car and I put on the radio and it's one of those few radio presenters who I have no beef with, I'll be like, I really like this radio presenter and I'll like make it and it's a bit of a joke between us. Yes, I know this is the one radio presenter you like. Yes, I know you don't like all the others. So your exception to the rule could also perhaps be the one example of something you don't like. Like, oh, I don't like jazz music except for some reason. I'll tell you a good example. I'm not particularly enamoured with country music. I don't know a lot about it. I don't mind it, but it's not something I would call myself a fan of. Yeah. And yet, quite like Garth Brooks. We've got this history with Garth Brooks and seen him in concert and I own lots of his albums. So he's kind of like an exception to the rule. If someone said to me, Brady, are you a country music fan? I would say, no, not particularly, but I'm a really big Garth Brooks fan. So he's like my exception to the rule. Oh, that's an interesting way because the exception to the rule isn't just that you love something but there's one thing you dislike. It can be the, the opposite. exact opposite. Hmm. A whole lot of things that you don't like. Oh, with the exception of that, I have to admit that one is a good one. Yeah. I tell you, I have a funny thing with albums that I often don't like the first song on an album. So Bruce Springsteen has an album, Tunnel of Love, and I couldn't even name the first song because I skip it every time. Bob Dylan's album, Oh Mercy, I always skip the first song, which I think is called Political World. I just don't like it. Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds have an album called No More Shall We Part and the first song, I love the album and I really dislike the first song. I don't know why. I tell you what, that's a good example of exceptions, right? Albums you like but you don't like the first song. But you could take that and a step further again and tell me an album on which you do like the first song. And that's an exception. I usually don't like first songs yeah, on yeah, albums, yeah. but there is this one album where the first song on the album <laughs> is my all-time favourite. Can you yeah. think of an album on which you really love the first song? Oh Well, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds have a live album called Live Seeds. It was the first album of theirs I got into, and the first song is called The Mercy Seat, and it's the best song they've ever written and is one of my, my top three or four favourite songs ever. So that's an exception. Uh, yeah. Nick Cave's <laughs> The Mercy Seat. And then, and then it's kind of downhill from there for the rest of the album. <laughs> <laughs> there is a few rules around albums, just to stay on them. This idea that you put the hit single as the first song was sort of big for a while. There's also a theory that says the worst song on the album is the second last song. So it's sort of hidden there before you end, you know, with a bang. So the worst song on the album is often the second last song. What a great podcast that would be, the second last song. And you just review the second last song on loads and loads of albums based on that theory and see how often it turns out to be true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that. That's a great podcast idea, the second last song. The funny thing is it means that I always look to the second last song to try and see what it is. And my favourite or one of my favourite albums, coming back to you two, is Aktung Baby. And the second last song is Acrobat, which I think is a fantastic song. And everyone's been begging for them to play it their entire, well, since Aktung Baby came out. And it's only on this last tour they've finally played it. It's the one song in their canon that they've never played live up until that point. Probably because they thought it was weak and a bit hard, but everyone loves it. I'm obsessed now. I want to go and look at every album that I really like and look what the second to last song on it is. <laughs> Another exception to my rule is one of my favourite albums, Automatic for the People by R.E.M., where their second last song is Night Swimming. Oh, that's my favourite is- R.E.M. song. <laughs> <laughs> that finishes quite strongly, that album, because yeah. I think they're three singles apart from Drive, the first song, this. Third last song is Man on the Moon, (laughs) probably their second or third biggest ever hit. Then Night Swimming, and then they finish with Find the River, which is probably my favourite R.E.M. song. Oh, that's such a great album all the way through, so strong. Night Swimming deserves a quiet night. You know, when I was at the BBC, I did a special series all about the River Trent where I went from the source to the sea and did like five reports on the news each night. And they all had music montages in them and as I was showing the beauty of the river. And in one of them I used night swimming because I went out on the river trend at night and I also used find the river in the – so oh. I, used, I used two of those songs in my uh, in that series. Oh, that's cool. Oh, this second last song thing. So we must come back to this sometime. This is too interesting. I'm so up for that. It's mm. unbelievable. Mm. <laughs> music related, I'm so up for all it. Right. We'll, we'll talk about this another time when we've done a bit more research because I think that's even better than my exception to the rule. But I do think exception to the rule has some potential – but maybe we haven't thought it through enough. I'm just wondering if it can get past pop culture, like consumable things like films and books and music. Oh, yeah, I like, I love ice cream, but I hate this flavour of ice cream. Oh, yeah, I don't like chocolate ice cream. 
I'd rather not have ice cream than chocolate ice cream and I'd have a whole bunch of others. Yeah. So it could be that. It could be like just like preferences. I love dogs, but I hate German shepherds. <laughs> like, you know, like, I don't hate German shepherds, by the way. <laughs> don't email me if you've got a German shepherd. Coming back to ice creams, when you go to an ice cream shop, do you order the same ice cream flavour every time or do you love looking around going, mm, what do I feel like today? I like looking around going, what do I feel like? And then I always, always gravitate back to the same few genres. But I, I'll mix it up. I, I'm not like I'm a rum and raisin all the way. I'll never have anything else. I will mix it up. Well, I am a rum and raisin. Now. Right. <laughs> you're, a, you're a rum and raisin. If I'm having, well, I have two flavours, boysenberry and rum and raisin. And if I'm having a two scoop, I'll have one each of those with boysenberry on top and rum and raisin underneath. I don't imagine they mix very well. Well, no, it's like two different worlds and they you, you move from one to the other, two acts of a, of a great play. What about the, the barrier though where the two meet and they start merging into one? What's that area like? Is, well, that, is nice. that fun? To, is it good to eat through that part? Because you sometimes forget the other one's there. So you're enjoying the boysenberry and then you go, oh, oh here we go. Here's the main course. <laughs> This is great. Move on to the rum. I've had those two flavours as long as I can remember mm. from a child. And I think Dad introduced me to rum and raisin and boysenberry. I can't remember where I discovered it, but I remember it was a revelation and it's been with me ever since. Those are my two flavours. Rum and raisin would be a cool nickname too. <laughs> rum and, you're going to start calling me rum and rum raisin. Rum and raisin. <laughs> Where's rum and raisin? Oh, he'll be here in 20 minutes. <laughs> Mr. Rum and raisin. I'll take it over boysenberry. <laughs> No, I'd be like, I like honeycomb. I like- Honeycomb's too sweet. I like light ice creams, like ones that are lighter coloured normally, like caramelly flavours. Mm. There's no real ice cream flavour I really dislike though. I, ha- I don't think I, oh, coffee flavour. But coffee flavour, anything doesn't count like because I hate the taste of coffee. So I don't like coffee flavoured ice cream, but that's not an exception. That's just sticking to my guns as, a, as an overall coffee hater. <laughs> that's good. We are polar opposites there. Yeah. <laughs> do you I, like coffee ice cream? I do. Yeah, yeah. Coffee flavoured ice cream. It won't make it into your rum and raisin boysenberry collection though. No, it's a bit of a backup yeah. it's sitting on the bench, but yeah. it's there to be had. I love vanilla as well, but I drink so much coffee. I just love coffee. Vanilla ice cream is like a waste of your ice cream allowance, though. No, no, no. Vanilla is a particular taste. It's not a neutral. It's not like water. No, no, true. But to me, it is. To me, vanilla is like, that's the base upon which you build other flavours and do things. So I like vanilla ice cream maybe on apple pie, but mm. vanilla ice cream on its own is like, it's the ice cream equivalent of water. <laughs> <laughs> Except with lots of calories. <laughs> All right. right. Anyway, I think people get the idea. So there we go. Exception to the rule. Let's move to Tim's final idea. Now, generally, I like Tim's ideas for podcasts, but will this next one be an exception to the rule? Hi, there, everyone. Today, I want to tell you about our sponsor, Hover. I've got no script. I've got no notes in front of me. I've just been using Hover lately, so I want to tell you about my own personal experience. Now, Hover, as you know, is a domain registrar. It's a website you go to 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 register names before or when you're making a website. You don't necessarily have to already have a website. You can use it as a place just to squirrel things away for a rainy day. And if you have got a name squirreled away, you can divert it to another website in the meantime. That's super easy to do. Now, you might be thinking, well, what do I need a domain name for? I don't have a website. I don't have a business. I don't have a podcast. But you might have an idea for something you want to do in the future, just some dream. When that time comes, you're going to need the name. And I'll tell you what, names go quickly. So if you've got an idea and you've got an idea for what to call it, snaffle that domain name now and do it with Hover because it is the best website for doing it. I have used other registrars in the past and it's an absolute nightmare. And in fact, just this week, for the first time, I took one of my domains with one of the old registrars and I moved it over to Hover to put in my like Hover bag. I had delayed doing this. I was a bit scared it was going to be difficult, but I tell you what, It was so easy. Hover do have like this valet service to help you do it, or you can just do it yourself. They give you all these instructions and they make it so simple. I tell you what, they've got really good people who are designing their website and writing their instructions because the other ones just completely baffle me. I hate using them. Hover is an absolute pleasure. And I would say that if this wasn't a sponsorship, I say it all the time just to my normal friends. But this is a sponsorship, so let me tell you about the offer. You can get 10% off your first Hover purchase if you go to hover.com. That's H-O-V-E-R dot com slash unmade. And then when you collect your first few domains and put them in your goodie bag, you can get 10% off their already excellent prices. Hover.com slash unmade. 
It's a pleasure to be sponsored by them because I really enjoy using their website. Well, it's really funny that my first idea was called Snippet because my second idea is about the names of hairdressers. Ah. (laughs) As you drive around, as I've been driving around England, this has really struck me as well, how the pressure is on to come up with a cute name for your hairdressing salon. Usually involving a terrible pun. That's right. A pun of some kind. And we Mm. drove past a couple the other day. And then I said, oh, look, you know, I made that point. And then you came out with, yeah, like Hair Force One, which I thought was fantastic. (laughs) But there's a whole range of these. And so I'm thinking this podcast could go to a particular store, talk about their name, why they came up with that name, then could go further and talk about the people and how they came to be hairdressers. Who are you? What's your story? That's right. And all those sorts of things. That's kind of the way in to talking to hairdressers. So to qualify to be on the show, basically, you just have to have an awful name and then we'll just do a story about your salon. And That's right. The good thing about this as well is that that hairdressers are born talkers. Like yeah. <laughs> they're basically it's... professional conversationalists. Yeah, yeah, true. I do like her. I, and each episode would be the name of that salon. They're also big on misspelling, aren't they? Like I don't think any hairdressing salon using the word cuts has ever not used a Z instead of the S <laughs> for cuts. <laughs> <laughs> Super cuts and things, things like that. Let me give you a couple that um, that I've come across. Yeah. To trim or not to trim. Right. Live and let die. Oh, <laughs> D-Y. Right, but, okay, D-Y-E, yeah, all right. Yep. <laughs> all the world's a salon. Much ado for almost nothing. <laughs> what, what much ado? Much for, ado, as in a hairdo. Yeah, yeah for yeah. almost nothing. For almost nothing, okay. as in you've got to pay a yeah. little bit and so forth. Yeah. Get thee to a blow dryer. <laughs> <laughs> These are actual names of salons. They are, they are. They're all based on like literature references. I, I never think of them being that. There's also pressure on them sounding like they're almost like nightclubs, like hair machine. You know, yeah. like it's a, a place where you're going to go and dance. Do and you drink. remember the ad in Adelaide for hair machine? No. It was the worst ad ever. Basically, it was just like a PowerPoint presentation of haircuts they'd done. And it had this music going, do, 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 hair machine. <laughs> do, 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 do. And it just said hair machine like about six times. Hair machine. Hair machine. Hair machine. And then at the end, like I, they mixed it up at the end. Didn't they? Oh, yeah, I remember that. Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> they'd won some award, like Salon of the Year. So that, like they didn't put a lot of effort into writing the lyrics of the, of the Hair Machine ad. It wasn't Salon Song of the Year, definitely. No, no, no. <laughs> Sherlock Combs, Jack the Clipper. <laughs> Jack the Clipper. <laughs> Curl up and die. Hairway to heaven. I like ones that just use hair, like, because that also not only is it like unfunny and unclever, they haven't even showed the creativity to move away from hair. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The hair up there. One of my favourite ones is the shearing shed, which is a particularly Australian kind of thing. I actually think that's a good name. All of these are good names. They're all genius. (laughs) Best little hair house. Hair.com. Art.com. I see. Heirloom. This is great because you've got people to talk to who love talking and love sharing stories and, and you can explain how do they get into hairdressing and, you know, how long have they been at the salon? Do they enjoy working there? You know what I mean? Because they have different regular clients and conversations that mm. continue on, relationships. People have a strong relationship with their hairdresser. I mean, I have had an idea on my list for a while now, which is just called Hairdresser, which is a podcast recorded in hairdressing chairs where... Kind of like, you know, how you get your taxi cab confessions sort of things where they record TV shows in taxi cabs and that. You could also have one where you just have a permanent podcast and probably the hairdresser is like your host, is your consistent person and the clients are the people being interviewed and the podcast always carries on for the length of the haircut. So you kind of get to know ah. someone and, in, and have the conversation between them while the haircut's going on. You even hear the snip. So every podcast almost starts off with, well, what are we having done today? Yeah. You know, a little bit off the back, oh, I want to change this and that. And then the hairdresser conversation becomes the podcast episode. And, you know, so you've got always new people coming into the chair. You could mix up your hairdressers and things like that. I think that's a good idea. I like your idea better because I like the funniness of the names of hairdressers. But as you say, hairdressers are professional talkers. People usually tend to open up a little bit at the hairdresser as well if Mm. they're in a good mood. So it is a good place for talking and conversation and that lends itself to a podcast every time. I like the idea of doing it with the snip snip in the background and having Mm. that conversation. And So Mm. it's like you're recording it while you're sitting there and they're talking and explaining your interview. It's a great interview situation, isn't it? Yeah, One chair interviewing. Yeah, Yeah. and you've got like this captive interviewee and you've got someone who's good at chatting and you always have your cliche questions, been on anywhere interesting on your holidays lately or got any holidays coming up. That's all I 
I ever talk about with my hairdresser is what do I want done? Holidays, Love Island at the moment. We always talk about Love Island. <laughs> Luckily, hairdressers are almost as in, much into Love Island as me. Oh, Does the hair salon you go to have like a ridiculous name or is it just like has it got something quite normal? No, nah, no, nah, it's pretty standard. Nah. Quick joint. You need to find a better one. You need to find one with like a zany name. I don't think I've ever gone to one with a really bad, embarrassing name, but you Here's a question. Why do so many of them have those sort of names? There's a lot of salons and the pressure is on to try and distinguish it from all the others. So it's basic marketing. How can we be identified as not just, you know, Jeff's hairdressing or something like that? There's so many. Yeah, you need to stand out. What I would love to see begin is a trend where hairdressers had to have a name like law firms with their surnames. So, oh, right, right. so okay, they said right. really official. Jones, Jones and Smith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wouldn't <laughs> that be awesome? I would definitely go to a hairdresser that had a had a lovely establishment kind of name like that. I think that's the direction they should be going too. Like I don't want zaniness in a hairdresser. I want like a safe pair of hands. Someone <laughs> Literally. kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> A bit of prestige and things like I'm. I'm actually a bit turned off by crazy names. I want my hairdressing salon to be like you know, Smith and Co. That's right. You want to trust them, don't you? Mm, but obviously, but- I'm in the minority there because the hairdressers go for the crazy names. Well, maybe that because people go looking for something zany, and when it comes to our hair, we don't want something zany. We want something. Apart from looking a bit like Morrissey, we want it to be <laughs> <laughs> pretty conventional and safe, don't we? Naming your business, though, like it's inconceivable to me that these businesses are being named without a lot of consultation, at least of your family and friends. Like, you know, oh, I'm opening a hairdresser. What are you going to call it? Oh, I'm going to call it Hair Force. What do you think? Obviously, they're getting feedback, like people saying, Haha, that's brilliant, you should call it that. Or like, are people just being polite and saying, yeah, that's a good name, and then behind their back thinking, that's crazy? Or like... Do you think they're getting told, yeah, it's, it's a good idea? I don't know. But I do know that when they go to register the name, they're going to be denied a name that's too similar to anyone else. So maybe they do go in with their cool name and they say, no, there's already a hair machine. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to go away and, um, you know, come up with something else. And so they keep thinking and thinking, to, you know, there's, it's a bit like registering a racehorse. This is why you get crazy <laughs> racehorse. There's so many racehorses and they can't all just be called Far lap. So you, <laughs> the pressure's on to come up with more and more zany and interesting names. Bangs for the memories. Clippity doo <laughs> Clippity doo Every day going to work at Clippity doo <laughs> Walk in, look at the sign. Yep. Comb as you are. Oh, yeah. Die hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to go to our subreddit and tell us the name of the hairdresser where you have your locks cared for. Oh, locks. There must be something in locks. All right, it's that part of the show where we discuss an idea coming from one of our Patreon supporters. You can go to patreon.com slash unmadefm to become one of our Patreon supporters and support the show. And that will also give you the keys to the kingdom, the ability to send us one of your ideas to be discussed here. Like Chase. Chase is a listener to the show. I actually have very bad memories of the name Chase, by the way. Why is that? (laughs) It's a bit of a long story. But when I was in high school, my school had a really bad soccer team. Like we weren't good. We were like a low division, right? This isn't our school. Not not as bad as the team you and I were in. That that was a whole other level of bad. This was like, this was before we went to school together. The school before that. And we had an average team. We were in like one of the lower divisions among schools. But then one year, these two new boys came to our school who were like superstar players. Right. But we were still in the low division. So every week we would win like 20 nil. We were in the we were in the wrong division all of a sudden. We were like this super team. But there was the higher division where all the good schools were and we never played against them. And the only time you played against them was in like the FA Cup. There was an FA Cup among schools, which mm-hmm. is a knockout competition that all the schools go in. And normally all the rubbish schools get knocked out early and then you have the final. And because we had this super team, we went all the way to the FA Cup final. We made it to the final against wow. against the other school that was the best school team in the whole state. And it was played at the old High Marsh Stadium where, like, the big adult teams played. It was like a massive honour for us under lights to play against this team. We couldn't believe it. We were these huge underdogs. And the other team had this, the best player in the state and his name was Chase. I remember him well. And we're like, he was like this to-be-feared player. And anyway, we put up this really brave performance in the final, this underdog team from the lower division, and they were like they were really good as well. 
And then it was the only time you would ever play a full length soccer match. They decided to make it like a 90 minute match. So our poor little legs were like really struggling to play this like 90 minute match at high my stadium. And then unbelievably, it was nil nil at full time and it went to extra time. So we had to play like another 30 minutes. These like poor kids on this, oh, wow. on this adult sized soccer pitch. And then one minute before the end, it was going to go to like penalty shootouts, which would have been absolutely terrifying. Mm. But one minute before the end of the match, one of their players had a shot and he hit our goalkeeper who had an unbelievable game, pulled off this amazing diving save and pushed it against the post and then just rolled back out and onto the field. And the evil chase was there waiting for it. And he like tapped in this easy goal and they won the game one minute before oh. the end. And I still remember him turning around with this look of glee on his face, having won the game in the last minute of extra time. And we were like all dejected and our little underdog team missed out on, on the FA Cup final because oh, of Chase. Because of you, Chase. How did you know his name? Because he, he was just like the good player. And because the good players we had in our team probably associated with him in like proper soccer circles right. away from school soccer because these guys also all played club soccer. So they would have known Chase through that. But he was like, you know, he was like the legend. So, And when you play like school sports, you know who the best players are on the other team. You do. You tend to not know anyone's name except one player on the other team yeah. who's talked about and yeah. pretty legendary. Anyway, sorry, Chase. I'm sure the actual soccer Chase was a really nice guy too. But, <laughs> but I'm sure our Chase is also nice. Chase is from the great state of Minnesota. His words, not mine. I'm currently going to school for my criminal justice degree and he hopes to become a police officer. Cool. His hobby is beekeeping and his podcast idea, he actually has two, but we'll just go with his first one. And his podcast idea, unsurprisingly, is a bee-related podcast talking about everything bees, how to raise them, what to look for when inspecting, news around them, things like that. Bee news, that's like his thing. Would you listen to a bee podcast? Is it is it bee news? Is that his? Is that the name? No, he, he hasn't just... given it a name. Oh, Obviously, okay. it's going to be called The Hive or something like that, isn't it? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I probably wouldn't. I haven't got mm. that big a passion. But I do, I am fascinated by beekeeping. I went to a place on Kangaroo Island, which is off the state of South Australia on a holiday, and there's a special bee place and you could buy honeycomb and, gosh, it's so delicious. And I love honey. And it is, it is always interesting you know, I, I would watch a documentary on beekeeping. It's so interesting. I don't know if I'd listen to a podcast again and again and again, but I would probably listen to it once if someone said, hey, this is a great episode, listen to this. You're fascinated by beekeeping? I am. There's this guy where I sometimes go and work in San Francisco, like the guy who's in charge of building management and accounts is in his spare time a beekeeper and I have I know that about him now and like I really – Whenever I get him like in the coffee room, I'll corner him for like 40 minutes and just ask him loads of questions about bees and beekeeping. And it's so fascinating how it all works with the queen and how hives work over the winter and how the queen moves around the hive over time and how all the drones work and who dies and who lives. And it's really dramatic and interesting beekeeping. And I think I'll probably – I'd listen to a podcast about it. I know a guy that makes YouTube videos about them that are quite interesting, but – I can imagine it could be pretty cool and you could have some nice sounds and get this real nice atmospheric feel of some man or woman out at the hives and taking out all the bits and pieces. And Can I ask you a question about it then? I know that there's like one queen in the hive. Hmm. Does that mean she's the only female and all the other bees are male? Yeah, well, there, are there drones as well that aren't male or female? I don't know. But there are like, there is definitely only one female. So is it sort of like a one to 1,000 ratio of male to female in the bee world? I don't know the answer to that. I did know when I spoke to Arthur about it, but now mm. now, I'm like, now it's all just fallen out of my head. Because well, we haven't got the podcast. We haven't got Chase's podcast to refer to. Chase, you need to get onto that as the episode number one. Are all the non-queens males or are you? can you be like a nothing? Well, sort of the opposite of hens and chooks. So you have all these females and then you kind of own one rooster but all these other hens yeah. and it's almost like there's a, um, you know, one to five ratio of yeah. male to female but the other way around. Hmm. I know there's also a lot of really interesting stuff to do with like warmth and like generating warmth in the winter and moving around and eating all the stuff you've stored during the summer to eat through the winter to get the queen through the winter and and like the little bowl that's got the queen in it surrounded by other bees who are all vibrating to keep her warm and eating all her stuff, all her food through the winter moves around the hive like this big bowl on a little journey going through and eating everything up and you can always you, – so in the winter you'll open up your hive and look where the – I don't know what the proper name for it is, but where the little queen ball is at the moment and stuff. So let me just ask a few naive questions about it then. 
how long does it take to make the honey? Like if I go and empty, it's empty and then we've got whole lots of bees in a hive, do you come back like in a day or is it like a month? How often is honey made? I don't know. These are good questions to which I don't know the answer. Yeah, how quick does it replenish when you like, are they angry when you steal all their honey or is that like, is that like? Bees seem like they're angry, like they're they're a threat. They yeah, but bees are always angry. <laughs> bees, bees are like, just, they're just angry dudes, aren't they? You know when you're at a picnic and someone spots a bee? It's like a nuclear siren <laughs> goes off. There's a bee, everybody, everybody, and everyone stops. Siren goes off, police are called. Yo, you think it's bad in Australia. You see what happens when an English person sees a bee or a spider. That's like. Oh, really? Yeah, that's like that's like nuclear meltdown. That is like, yeah. English people freak out about insects and spiders a way that Australians don't. That's true. In fact, while I've been here in England and I have conversations with shopkeepers and different people, including a hairdresser the other day when I got a haircut, (laughs) and they talk about Australia. What they bring up is, oh, I couldn't go to Australia. I'd be too worried I'd get killed. (laughs) Not natural disasters, but, you know, sharks and spiders. Nature, yeah. It's it's the wildlife, yeah. Mm. people, English people are absolutely terrified of Australian wildlife. I don't know. We've obviously got some PR problems because- People always say to me, like, you know, do you feel scared when you're there? And I'm like, I don't even, like, see it. Like, you don't think about it. Although although a few months ago I saw a redback spider, I picked up a piece of wood and I just had a sixth sense to turn it over just to check when you pick something up. What did you do? I killed it. Did you? Right. Mm. I had to put the wood on another pile to use it and so, I, yeah, I killed it. But I do, like I check my gum boots or Wellingtons as they're called in England, I you know, give them a quick bang and then, you know, turn them upside down just in case there's a spider. And then foolishly often, you know, then you put your hand in just to sort of brush out anything, which is just basically saying, here, sting me on the hand instead of on the foot. All right. There we go. Bees, the bee podcast with Chase. Thanks for getting in touch, Chase, and good luck in your ongoing quest to become a policeman. Did Chase say that he has bees or he's just interested in bees? Yeah, he's got bees. He's a beekeeper. He supplies a picture of himself. He supplied a picture, which is his Christmas card he sent this year, and it's him holding in his hands like it looks like several hundred bees, like they're just all there. Oh, he's wow. He's got like a handful of bees, and that's Chase's Christmas card. That's incredible. But look, at he's got them in his hand. Yes. There we go. He's also got quite a beard on him, Chase, but I think that's a real beard. It's not one of those... You know, bee beards. Bee, bee beards that people have. Yeah, he's not. As boy. That would be even more awesome. They're people. Who, what do they do? I think they must have to hang a queen on their neck to make all the bees go there and form that bee and beard. They, oh. But Chase just has a real impressive beard and a handful of bees. Oh wow! Thanks for being a patron supporter, mm. and good luck with the uh, good luck with the bees. I wonder if, like, so many people who keep bees, he makes bad bee puns, like, oh, behave. <laughs> <laughs> he calls everyone honey. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you should start, you could start a hair salon. <laughs>